refugees and uh, this formation scenario we've heard a little bit about. Hi everyone, good morning. So it's great to be here. I work at Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam. And the work I'm gonna talk about today, it's, uh, as has been said, ultra diffuse galaxies, a formation scenario. And that's something that I've done in collaboration with Chris Brook, Avishai, which is here, and the group of people on Nihao collaboration. So I would like to offer you an overview of what we knew and what we know in the last, uh, what we learned in the last couple of years about UDGs, and we'll try to follow a chronological order. So let me start with the first paper ever where we found the name of UDGs. As Aaron already said, it's a Bandokum et al. 2015 papers in which they show how using the Dragonfly telephoto array, they were able to find a population of about 47 uh, galaxies within the comma cluster with peculiar properties. This is a this is a plot of effective radius on the vertical axis as a function of uh, surface brightness and you can see that the coma population in red has effective radii compatible with a giant galaxy like the Milky Way, so between 1 and 5 kiloparsec, but they have the surface brightness of small dwarf galaxies. So the question immediately arises about what are these galaxies? Are they failed Milky Way that for some reason they just stop forming stars? or are they genuine dwarf galaxies, but then we have to understand why they are so extent, so large in size. So just after the Van Dokum paper, another one came out by um, Coden collaborators. They used the Subaru telescope to actually show that within the coma cluster, the population of UDGs is huge. It's about 1,000 of them. They all seem to follow the red sequence of coma, indicating a passively evolving population. So initially people thought the UDGs were associated univocally with clusters. After this paper, uh, Romane Trujillo using the SDSS Stripe 82 survey, they show that uh, in fact, uh, the cluster environment is not a necessary condition to find UDGs and about 50% of UDGs found in the Abel uh, 16A cluster were not associated with the cluster itself, but they were outside of the cluster. So that's the first uh, indication the UDGs can form outside of clusters. Of course, uh, in order to respond to answer the question, are these galaxies dwarf or fail Milky Way, we would need uh, ideally to measure the total mass, which is pretty hard to do because these galaxies are really faint and fuzzy. So some attempt has been made by the group of people in uh, Canary Island, Michael Beslein collaborator. They do uh, counts of globular clusters numbers and they also use uh, dynamical uh, measurements uh, in order to infer the virial mass of one of the galaxies within the Virgo cluster and they found that the total halo mass is compatible with something eight times in 10 to the 10 solar masses, which means that these galaxies are dwarf, at least this galaxy over here. Uh, okay, so then the question is, can we create, can we try to simulate these galaxies? Uh, I've used any house simulation, as many of you know, or others don't. It's a project that includes about 100 simulated galaxies that span a wide range in mass from Milky Way size all the way to dwarf. You can see this is the stellar mass versus halo mass relation. All the Nihau simulation are shown in blue and they follow pretty well the expected uh, relation. Let me start over in halo. This simulation used the code Gasoline, an improved version of Gasoline. They include um, blast wave feedback from supernovae and also feedback from massive stars before they explode the supernovae. So a nice feature of the simulation, if I can start them, is that, um, let's call it a bit further. So thanks to uh, the high density threshold for star formation and thanks to the particular feedback implementation, these galaxies are able to launch galactic scale outflows. You can see in this movie, this is a movie that shows the formation of a galaxy. It's a gas temperature map. And this uh, massive outflows of gas, as has been said several times during this conference, they are useful in order to form dark matter core. So these are really useful in order to determine the final dark matter distribution within galaxies. And the reason why this happened has been explained really nicely in this review by Ponce and Governato. This is a cartoon from the review. Uh, this is dark matter particles they initially orbit around a central dense star forming gas clump. Then we got a bang. This bang is a uh, stars exploding as supernovae. And what happened in that a lot of gas is evacuated from the central part of the galaxy, which means that the gravitational potential actually decreases 
uh, immediately towards the center of the galaxy, the dark matter feels this uh, lowering in gravitational potential and moves forward, outwards, sorry. Uh, they also show that this process is uh, cumulative, so we do not need to uh, expel or move all of the gas at the same time, we can just do it in subsequent cycles, and this really has been shown by several groups and several simulations to uh, create a central dark matter core. At which scale does this core formation happen? Well, there is a sweet spot, which happens to be about here, which is for galaxy between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 stellar masses. And the sweet spot happens because at lower masses, for, for dwarf galaxies, there is just not enough energy from supernova feedback in order to modify the dark matter profile, while at higher masses towards the Milky Way, the gravitational potential of the underlying 10 to the 12 dark matter halo is really huge, so stellar feedback by itself cannot do anything. But then in the central region, we are able to efficiently form a core. So once again, this is a plot that shows the inner dark matter density measured between 1 and 2% of the viral radius as a function of stellar mass over halo mass. This plot is using the original uh, magic simulation, and then this has been confirmed lately uh, with anyhow simulation. So what you can see in this plot in the first figure is that different colors and different symbols correspond to different initial conditions and feedback parameters, and galaxies do not really care about the specific of the feedback parameter and initial condition. All they care about is how much stellar mass there is as a function of halo mass. So that gives you more or less the budget between uh, energy from supernovae versus gravitational potential energy of a, uh, initially an FW halo. So these results have been confirmed with our simulation and feedback implementation. We've seen, and maybe we will see later again, this uh, fire simulation from Chan et al. paper, but also some more recent Moria galaxies uh, run by people in Belgium. They found a similar dependence of uh, halo of inner dark matter core versus halo mass. Okay, I had to give this uh, brief introdu introduction about uh, core formation because we'll see that's what caused the emergency of uh, the emergence of UDGs in our simulation. So I went and looked at the Nihao sample and I select all galaxies that had an effective radius larger than one, but yet uh, surface brightness uh, larger than 23, uh, magnitude per arc second square, which are dwarf galaxies basically. And surprisingly, I found a lot of those objects. So within the all Nihao data set, which is 100 galaxies, I found about 20 galaxies, which uh, satisfy the criterion for UDGs. You can see from top to bottom, this is the color, B minus R, the effective radius, the magnitude as a function of, sorry, the surface brightness as a function of absolute magnitude. In red is galaxies from the comma cluster, in blue is galaxies in and around the Abel cluster, so you can see already they're a little bit bluer, and it, the black points are our simulated UDGs. So they lie on top of observation uh, nicely, and then we can go and look at their properties. In this table, I've summarized the average properties of these galaxies. Uh, the stellar mass is between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8. Uh, the search seek index is uh, around 0 0.8 on average. Of course, they have a central dark matter core. Um, and most interesting, uh, we can look at their uh, total halo mass, which for all of them is between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11. So all of these galaxies are actually dwarf galaxies and Nihao simulation are isolated galaxies only. So we found dwarf galaxies being UDGs in isolation. When we then go and compare uh, the mass profiles of our simulation in uh, colors with uh, observations, we see that observational data are compatible as well with halo masses between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11. These uh, little balls are points from Bezlian collaborators, and this uh, triangle is Dragonfly 44, which is perhaps the largest ever measured uh, ultra diffuse galaxies. In the original Bandokun paper, it's claimed that this galaxy live into a 8 times 10 to the 11 halo, but you can see here that we can fit it pretty nicely with a 10 to the 11 halo. So perhaps the difference arises because of different uh, concentration mass relation. We use the Planck one. 
Um, some of, as has been said already, some of our galaxies have ongoing star formation, so they're not all uh, red and quenched. Uh, this one uh, has, is uh, our simulations. Uh, we are showing here a multi-bane image, and you can see there is a blue of center over density, which is kind of resembles uh, a blue of center over density found in an isolated galaxies in a Martinez Delgado et al. study. Okay, so how do these galaxies form in our simulation? Well, I guess it's uh, obvious by this point that we say already that the same mechanism that is able to create dark matter cores at the center of galaxy also affects the stellar distribution within it. So here we see from green to blue, we are moving from redshift four to redshift zero. In the top left, we have the dark matter density profile that evolves from being caspi, which is the embodied prediction, to be flat towards the center, so we observe a central core. And then the uh, right side figure is the 3D stellar density, again as a function of redshift, so you see how moving forward with time, subsequent outflow caused by a bursty star formation history can expand the stellar distribution as well. And we double check, we make sure that this uh, process actually happens for the old stellar population as well. What we can do then, we can make observational prediction that can be tested. So we, um, we ask the question, what is the difference between a ultra diffuse galaxy and a dwarf galaxy that does not end up with a similarly large effective radius? So in this plot, you can see in each row, we show uh, galaxies with the same halo mass, the same stellar mass, but different effective radii. In the right side is the one that end up being larger, so the most extreme UDGs. And you see that uh, one of the main differences in the gas content. So galaxies that end up being the largest UDG have much more H1 gas compared to galaxies that are more compact. Um, this is also reflected in the extent of H1. The H1 disk of these UDGs is as large as 10 kiloparsecs. Um, so the prediction is that the largest isolated ultra diffuse galaxy should contain more H1 gas than their uh, more compact counterpart. And so we thought that maybe UDGs could actually be the dark, dark galaxy of the Alpha Alpha survey. And so it was very nice to see this recent paper by Lesman and collaborators, exactly using the Alpha Alpha data. They found that 115 isolated UDGs were being harbored behind this uh, previously unidentified Alpha Alpha sources. Uh, in the right side, sorry, in the right side plot, you can see the mass uh, profile uh, as a function of radius of three of their objects in black, uh, over plotted on our simulated mass profile. So you also see that the mass profile seem to indicate that these galaxies live in two halo of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11. And the fact that we, you know, people eventually found UDGs in isolation means that UDGs can form in isolation and then accrete into clusters. What they also found is that the isolated UDGs tends to be H1 rich relative to their stellar mass. So you see here the H1 uh, amount of gas, the H1 sorry, fraction as a function of stellar mass and UDG galaxies have more gas than the other smaller counterparts. After this uh, alpha alpha paper, a couple of other independent papers from Trujillo and Bellazzini, they study other isolated UDGs and they all shown that they have a H1 uh, fraction really large between 10 and 90, typical of almost dark dwarf galaxies and they have a Cersei key index of around one. Finally, I'd like to mention this uh, plot by Papa Sturgis and collaborator. I found it very interesting because they show that while some isolated UDGs have high gas fractions, those points in yellow, other ones seems to have uh, a really low gas fraction, so to be gas poor, the one in blue. Uh, they overplotted their points over our simulation, which are the stars, and over the alpha-alpha UDGs, which are also shown as uh, violet points. So in their paper, they claim that perhaps there is uh, more than one formation scenario, because of course our formation scenario requires that you keep a lot of gas within your galaxy in order to be able to form a core. 
uh, finally, uh, this is a, was a very nice paper from Stephen van der Burg and collaborators, of course, in order to uh, put the final word on whether or not these galaxies are dwarf or uh, Milky Way galaxies. Uh, it's important, as I say, to measure the total mass. It's hard to do it. These people try for the first time to use weak, to use weak gravitational lensing to infer the upper limit on the average gel of mass of about 800 UDGs found in 18 clusters, a low redshift. And what they show is that the mass within 30 kiloparsec of these galaxies is uh, compatible with them being dwarf galaxies. So what is the prediction of our model? Well, we predict that these UDGs uh, can be found in isolation, that their halo mass is compatible with being dwarfs. They are gas-rich. In fact, the largest one should be the most gas-rich. Uh, they are bluer in the field than in cluster. Uh, there is also a correlation between star formation history type and their size. And for conclusion and future, uh, UDG seems to be a natural outcome of lambda CBM that include uh, the role of variants and modifying dark matter halos in galaxies. In fact, in our model, we find that core formation is most efficient exactly in the mass range of UDGs, which is between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. So we can simply look at UDGs as the dwarf tail of low surface brightness galaxies. And also, let me add that perhaps the name UDGs, I mean, these galaxies were there already, they just were not called UDGs. In fact, if you just look at the spark sample of local H1 rich galaxies, about 20% of them in the mass range uh, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 have effective radii larger than 2. Think, for example, uh, WLM that will fall into the definition of UDG. For the future, I think what we need to do is to study the abundance of UDGs in the field. Hopefully, a future survey will help us. Uh, we need to explore the role of environment and how it affects the color and uh, the gas content of these galaxies. And finally, derive or try to derive star formation history to study the link between the star formation when it occurs and what the galaxy will look like in the end in terms of uh, effective radius. And so this is a project that I'm trying to do with people at ESE, the Institute of the Canary Islands, Institute of Astrophysics of Canary Islands. And uh, just a little bit of publicity, there will be a project going on from January next year when I'm moving there. Uh, we're trying to collaborate like observers and simulators in trying to understand UDGs and low surface brightness galaxies in general. And thank you. Right. So, yeah, the, the anyhow simulation were already there. We didn't do anything. We just, I mean, Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Yeah, so all the, the simulation we have are isolated only. So I don't know what happens in terms of stripping uh, gas amount once they get stripped and uh, enter into a cluster. But that's what we need to do, I think. If they're already there, where? They're already there in terms of matching the properties of UDG prior to infall. Yeah. So in clusters, they are gas poor. So that's something which is in favor of our theory. In the cluster are gas poor. And I guess the, the question, I mean, 
because the effective radius of these galaxies is between one and three kiloparsec, one and five kiloparsec. So you are thinking that maybe the effective radius will be also affected once you get into the cluster. Yeah. When you go and look towards the cluster center, you see a decrease in number density, as Chris was saying, of UDGs, which will make sense if they get disrupted. So we didn't look in detail at the shape, but most of the ones that I was looking at were puffy galaxies. They were not disks at all. So. Yeah, we need, we need to do that carefully. At the moment, we look at that, you know, qualitatively, and they seem not to be disky. They seem to be more round the shape, but we need to do it more carefully.